Good morning, Maple Ridge Church. I am so glad that you've decided to join us on this Sunday, June 7th, a very important day for our church and many churches. We are going to regather uh, as a church today. Um, I'm glad that you're tuning in online because when you're online, you can get the full sermon. I just want you to know the pattern we're going to go into for a little while is we'll be continuing our series in Genesis at 930 online so everybody can see it. If you don't feel comfortable regathering, we understand that. Stay home. Please stay safe. Um, everybody has somebody that's important to them to stay home for, so you do that if you feel you need to. But if you feel like you want to come to the church and gather in the parking lot for an outdoor service, you can, you can watch the sermon at 930, and then you can come to the church for a 1045 outdoor parking lot service. We're going to regather for a service. Now, just know something about that parking lot service. Um, there's not going to be a sermon repeat of what I do at 930. So if you want to hear the sermon, tune in at 930. We're going to have testimonies and singing and sharing. Uh, we're going to have a devotional at the outdoor service. So just know it's a devotional message from the Bible, but not a full sermon. Um, a couple of things that I want you to keep in mind. If you're going to be heading to the church today at 1045, just know there's a few rules or guidelines that we want everybody to adhere to um, for this Sunday. Uh, we're recommending that people stay in their car, roll down your window, it's a beautiful day. Or if you get out of your car, stay within two feet of your vehicle. Um, we're not only going to be social distancing from each other six feet, uh, but we're going to social distance our cars. We're going to physically distance our cars and have them parked every other parking spot. And we have parking lot attendants who will direct you as to where you would like to park. Um, we're, we're saying in terms of masks and wearing a mask, that's at your discretion. And the restrooms in the church will be available um, on a limited basis as needed. And the playground for the children is closed. Um, there are many activities that you can join online throughout the week. So please make sure you look at the, uh, the Friday email newsletter, the Friday newsletter. And you can find out all the different activities you can do online with the Maple Ridge Church family. So those are the announcements for today about this service today. I want to address something that I've been waiting for about three weeks to, um, to share with you. Uh, one of, one of the, the things I've come to realize during this COVID-19 uh, experience where we've been isolated is questions that God asked mankind in Genesis. A question he asked to Adam and Eve and a question he asked to Cain he asked a question to them. And I'm realizing that the questions that I'm willing to ask of myself are more important than the answers I think I know. And I want you to think about that. The questions we're willing to ask ourselves before the Lord, in all honesty, those questions are more important than the answers we think we know. Oftentimes, the answers we think we know come out of defensiveness. Somewhere within us, we're defending something. And maybe God wants us to go and do a deeper dive in our hearts and minds to find out why we're so quick to be defensive or to justify or to ignore or to be silent. God asked those two questions. The, the question he asked to Adam was the question, Adam, where are you? Where are you? The question he asked to Cain in the next chapter is, Cain, where is your brother? Now, I'll tell you something about that first question. During the COVID crisis, the question that God asked Adam has been just rolling around in my heart and actually haunting me in some ways. The question, where are you? Because when we stopped meeting as a church in March, it really shook me to my pastoral core. There are so many things that I took for granted as your pastor. And when I was forced to be in isolation and bring this question from God to my mind and heart, Scott, where are you? There are some things that I discovered that really, I think I've put too much emphasis on some things. Um, at first when the pandemic hit, I was, I was frustrated, like many of you were, and I, I said things like, look what this pandemic has done to us, to our church or to our country. Look what it's done to us. And then I brought this question to my heart before God. 
Scott, where are you? And so at a deeper level, that question changed from, look what this has done to us, to a different question. Look what this COVID experience has revealed in us. Look what it's revealed in us. And by that, I mean this, something very specific. You see, uh, those of you who play chess, you may be aware, and I'm not a great chess player, but you know the importance of the queen piece in the game of chess. And the evangelical church in America, and we're included in that, has made Sunday morning activities and worship and fellowship the centerpiece of our church. And it's not bad. It's not wrong. It's good to have a queen. Because you, you, that's how you win a game oftentimes is with your queen. It controls a lot of the board. But what happens is you forget how to use the other pieces on the board that you've been given. And you see, our queen was taken away from us. And I think we've never thought through the other pieces that God's given us to play the game, if you want to call it that. How are we going to play, I hate to call it the game of church, but just using the chess analogy, how are we going to win? How are we going to build disciples for Christ without the queen? And that really made me understand there's things I had to let go of. I had to learn the importance of a ministry of absence not just a ministry of presence. So much on Sunday morning when you come here, I can be here and I can see you. I could greet you before the pandemic. I could give you a hug. I could shake your hands and our world has changed. There is no more normal. I was forced to let go of things I thought I couldn't live without and it brought me closer to God. And now I'm trying to figure out how I can lead our church into this time of uncertainty. Here's what I've come out of it with. I've come out of it with a, a greater love for, for the people of God at Maple Ridge. And I've understood the importance of the ministry of absence. You know, I have my Bible here with me, and the New Testament was written, a lot of it, by the Apostle Paul. And do you know why it was written? The Apostle Paul wrote the letters of the New Testament because he couldn't be present with them. So our Bibles that we have in our hand are all because there was a ministry of absence. So there's a gift that God has for us that we can discover without our queen peace. If we take time to listen to the question, Scott, where are you? Maple Ridge, where are you? I believe we're going to come out of this stronger than before. That's the first question. Where are you? Now, the other question that's been troubling me is the question that God asked to Cain after he murdered his brother. And the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother? George Floyd is my brother. And I hear God saying, where is he? And Scott, what have you done about it? You see, it struck a deep nerve in me when he was killed by a police officer because, I don't know if you know this, but I served as a chaplain where I lived in Michigan for many years. A wonderful experience, an incredibly good police department, real good community policing. I saw the best. I was with the best. And I was furious when I saw that video. I was furious at an act of wickedness, an act of injustice. And it's not just an act. As I've been reflecting on this, as I've been thinking about the question that God, it's not just one individual event. I've been reflecting on this before the Lord. And I see now that there are underlying issues that perpetuate it. So when I ask the question, where is my brother I've been silent. And as a white pastor of a gospel preaching church, I cannot remain silent in the face of injustice to people of color who are my brothers and sisters in Jesus, and especially in our church, members of our church. So when God said to me, where are you, Scott, in the middle of the pandemic? I had some soul searching to do. And then when God said to me at the tail end of this pandemic, when he's saying to me, where's your brother? I realized both of those together mean this. Until I find my brother, 
I can't locate myself. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and what? Your neighbor as yourself. So like a virus, it's not just something that's been done to us. I believe what's happened in the recent weeks has revealed something in us as a church and as a nation. And by church, I mean the entire church, the white church. And our words can't fix this, only deeds can fix this. And I have now resolved to use my voice and my influence to make a difference without becoming a useful idiot to a political party or any organization. And I don't know exactly what that's going to mean, but I know I can't stay the way I was because I'm not the person I was. I'm coming out of my arc of isolation. Because the questions we're willing to ask are more important than the answers we think we know. And so I ask you at Maple Ridge Church these questions today before I preach this message from Genesis 14. I want to ask you those same questions, and I'm not going to give you the answers because that does you no good. I know what I need to do. I don't know what you're supposed to do. Uh, we're going to ask these questions. Where are you and where is your brother? And I'm going to lead us through a time of silence. So as you're there in your living room or listening to this on your device, wherever you might be, there's going to be a moment of silence. So would you bow your heads with me as we reflect on these two questions? Where are you and where is your brother? Let's pray. God, in your word, you said that you've shown us what is good and what you require of us. You said that through the lips of the prophet Micah. And what you've shown us, Lord, what is good for us and what you require of us from your word is that we do justly, not just talk justly, but do justly. That we love mercy. And that we walk humbly with you as our God. So, Lord Jesus, I ask that you teach us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. God, I ask that you would comfort the afflicted, the afflicted in our own church family, our brothers and sisters of color, the afflicted in George Floyd's family, that you would comfort them, the afflicted of the businesses in our own city that have been destroyed by wanton acts of violence. God, I ask that you would comfort the afflicted. But Lord, I can't stop just there. We have to pray too that you would afflict the comfortable. And that means me. Because I hear you saying to me over and over again, where are you and where is your brother? So, Jesus, I pray that as we open up your word here in just this next moment from Genesis 14, Jesus, I ask that we could get past our defensiveness and that you would reveal all the insulations that we're even unaware of in our life. Jesus, I ask that you would gently open our souls, gently open our souls, and speak your word into our soul. Lord, I believe you want to do this, and now we wait for you to do it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if you take your Bibles and turn to Genesis 14, I want to have you look at the entire chapter of Genesis 14. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 24. Uh, Genesis 14, it's about a time in Abraham's life when he was involved in violence. It's a time of violence. And it raises questions to the people that Moses was writing to. Remember, the book of Genesis was written by Moses, inspired by the Holy Spirit, written to the people of God who just left 400 years of slavery in Egypt. And now 
Moses is trying to raise questions by telling stories that can help the recently freed Hebrew slaves live a new way and get over the kind of life and the systemic injustices that they lived with as slaves and that they wouldn't repeat those when they go into the promised land. And so God tells Moses to include this story of Abram, something to think about. Here's what it comes down to. What do you do when something that belongs to you is in the hands of somebody else? You see, God promised to Abram that he would give the promised land to Abram's descendants. That was a promise from God. Well, how is Abram going to respond when he's in the promised land and everybody else is in control of it and he's not? How do we respond when enemies arise around us and threaten those people that we love? Now, uh, uh, let's just say this from the outset. Abraham is not interested in conquest. This isn't what this is about. Abraham is not interested in conquest. He only wants to see his family rescued. You're going to see that in just a moment. He only wants to see his family rescued. And so Abraham, he's participating in this act of violence and it puts him in a position where he can seize power. And one of the questions that the Israelites are going to have to ask themselves is this. Is seizing power through violence the way God wants his people to get what he promised them? Now as a follower of Jesus Christ, it is clear from Jesus' teachings that all of his followers are to renounce violence of any kind. Violence does not bring about the kingdom of God. He told Peter, put away that sword. So we never go to war for Jesus. Let's be crystal clear at that. But there's a reason why this is in God's word in Genesis 14. And we want to learn from this. We want to see Jesus in this. And also, Jesus makes clear that we are going to encounter enemies. So here's what I want to do. I want you, to, would you write this down in your outline? Please write this down. If you've got a piece of paper, write down. You'll see it on the screen. Write this down. What to do with your hands in a time of violence. What to do with your hands in a time of violence. Look with me at chapter 14, verse 1. Lots of difficult names. We'll try to get through this. It says, at the time of Amraphel, that was king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Elisar, Ketalomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goyim. Ooh, that just that. That's a mouthful. But don't, don't lose. Don't, don't stop paying attention. I want you to see what's here. Look at verse 2. These kings went to war against Bera, king of Sodom, and Bersha, king of Gomorrah. Okay. We're going to stop right there. There's a lot of hard to pronounce names here, but I think you get the idea. It, it's hard to pronounce these names, but these are the names of powerful people who live in the same region that Abram lives in, in his world. So let me, as you look at verses 1 through 3, let me try to give you a summary in, in, instead of you trying to figure out how to pronounce every name. Here's the summary. There's four kings from a region east of Abram that have to be fought. There's five kings that were rebelling. So five, four against five. And these kings were each ruling over cities. They didn't have like nations. It was like a nation state. So I, I, think of it this way. Imagine the king of Woodbury, Woodbury, Minnesota, along with three of the neighboring cities east of the metropolitan area, coming against the king of Maple Grove. And Maple Grove has four of our neighboring cities together. And for 13 years, just to put this in perspective, just so you could imagine what this looks like, the kings of the east, the kings of the eastern suburbs, were in control of 94, 694, and 494. And all the commerce that went on there, they got all the profits from that. And we had to turn over the profits that went through our cities. Well, we got tired of that in the west. And so we said, you know what, we want a piece of the action. And so we're going to rebel. We're going to rebel against the king of Woodbury and their three neighboring suburbs. Now imagine that one of our neighboring suburbs here in the western part of the Twin Cities is called King of Sodom. Well, that's one of the cities where 
And guess who's living in that city? Lot. Abram's nephew. And they start fighting. The, the kings of the east come over here, and they start fighting in our own backyard. We're fighting in the western suburbs. The different suburbs are going at each other. We're fighting on our home turf, and we lose, surprisingly, because in the middle of the battle, uh, our own troops, if you want to think of it that way, they are fighting in the gravel pits of Maple Grove, and they fall into some big, huge holes, which you'd think we would know are there because it's our own backyard, but apparently we didn't. And so look with me at verse 10. Now the valley of Siddim was full of tar pits, and when the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some of them fell into them, and the rest fled into the hills. So not too smart. They didn't know their own backyard and their, their own terrain, and that's what happened. Look at verse 11. The four kings, see the, the four kings from, from Woodbury, seized all the goods in the western suburb, Sodom and Gomorrah, and all their food, and they went away. Verse 12, they also carried off Abram's nephew Lot and his possessions since he was living in Sodom. Okay, that sets the stage as to what this chapter is about. So would you write this down in your outline? Number one, confront the enemy that threatens those you love. Confront the enemy that threatens those you love. Would you write that down, number one? Because we started by saying, what do you do with your hands in a time of violence? Number one, confront the enemy that threatens those you love. Now, what you're going to see in this story in Genesis 14 is, is Abram had influence and power in that region. And Abram's world, by the way, Abram's world is peaceful and quiet. He's not living in the western, he's living nearby, but not in the western suburbs, not in the eastern suburbs, just somewhere else, maybe the northern suburbs, maybe the southern suburbs. But he catches wind of what happens, and his, he's fine, he's prosperous. He could have, Abram could have just sat on his hands. But now violence has broken out in the western suburbs. And it's as if God says to Abram, where's your brother? Where's your brother? Abram, what are you going to do with all the influence and power and the control that you have in your peaceful, prosperous life? So would you write this down in your outline, confronting the enemy? It's a bullet point. Your hand will be forced to make a hard choice. Your hand will be forced to make a hard choice. We see this in verses 1 through 12. Your hand is forced to make a hard choice. It's so easy to ignore injustice until it hits your family and the ones that you love. You know, when you hear a statistic of this many people suffer this or this many people died this way, that's a statistic and that's too bad. But boy, when it's your family member as one of those statistics, you see, a, a, a million people is sad, one person's a tragedy, and that gets the whole world's attention. It's so easy in times of prosperity and comfort to just, you know, even to sit back. Abram, Abram could sit back on his hands and say, well, you know what? My, my nephew Lot kind of deserved that. He was kind of a freeloader. He chose to live in that part of the, you know, that, that's what he, maybe he just needs to learn a tough lesson. I'm just going to sit in my hands. Abram doesn't do that. He's, his, his hand is forced. It'd be, easy, it'd be easy for Abram to say, he was 75 at the time. It'd be easy for Abram to say, Look, Lord, I'm 75 years old. I, I don't want to go to war. I'm too old for this. I mean, just yesterday, I was doing, doing some yard work, and I had to get up on a, a big, lat, tall ladder, like 15, 20 feet up into the air, taking care of some things. And I'm up there, and I'm 55 years old, almost 55, and I'm up there thinking, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. <laughs> this, this is not a safe, this doesn't feel safe. So I don't want to get up on a ladder. Sometimes, you're 75 years old. You don't even want to mow your yard anymore, let alone go to war. So what's Abram going to do at 75? And he's comfortable. What's he going to do? Well, we know what he did. And in verse 13, there's a guy who escapes from the battle that took place in the western suburbs when everybody fell into the gravel pit. This guy escaped from the battle, ran up to Abram and said, hey, look, your nephew Lot's been captured. They took everybody who lived in the western suburbs. They took them as prisoners. They took all their stuff. Look at verse 13. It says, now Abram was living near the great trees of Mamre, the Amorite. Notice this, an Amorite, a brother of Eschol and Aner, all of whom were allied with Abram. Abram had neighbors who weren't believers in God. They, they didn't believe the same thing Abram believed. They had different agendas. 
But Abram lived there as allies with them. Do you see that? In verse 13, allied with Abram. So Abram has a voice, and Abram has influence, and he's going to use it. He's going to use it to rescue someone from injustice. And his friends he's allied with, who don't share the same belief system as Abram, those friends are going to join Abram in writing this wrong. Would you write this down in your outline as you're taking notes? Would you write down, use what God has given you to do the right thing? Use what God's given you to do the right thing. So what do you do with your hands in times of violence? Well, you've already written this down. You confront the enemy that threatens to, to those you love. You, you're gonna be forced, your hands are going to be forced to make a hard decision. And then you need to use what God's given you to do the right thing. And when, and when you know it's the right thing to do, you find people who can get the job done. And those are the people that lived around Abram, that were allies with him. And those relationships are a gift from God. They don't have to be Christians to have, be a gift from God. They don't have to be followers of Jesus to be a gift from God. Abram's friends, they don't follow Abram's God. But they know the right thing to do when they see it. Look at verse 14. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the 318. Notice this, trained trained training is important to right wrongs trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as dan training is important abraham knew they had to have training before they could take on this battle this took some forethought abram knew that he was going to be marching marching alongside of people who are his allies, who don't share. They don't have like a little checkbox to say, do you believe all the things I believe? Then I'll march with you. They had one thing they knew they were going to march together, so shoulder by shoulder, and they were going to do this together to right this wrong. And if you look at the map of the time, you'll see that where they marched from, it was about 100 miles on foot. It took them 100 miles on foot to do the right thing. And by the way, Abram didn't just say, well, I'll just, I'll just say a prayer and send my thoughts that way. That's not what Abram does. Abram doesn't just hope and pray that it all turns out. Abram does something about it. You see, that reminds us of what Jesus' half-brother James said to us. James said, faith without deeds is dead. Talk is cheap. Look at verse 15. During the night, Abram divided his men to attack them, and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobah, North of Damascus, he recovered all the goods and brought back his relative lot and his possessions together with the women and all the other people. See, Abram didn't just hope it would turn out okay. By the way, hope is not a plan. Abram used the resources God had given him. And boy, I tell you what, the people that Moses is writing to in Genesis, those recently released Hebrew slaves... They understand that action is important, not just words. Okay, so now Abram meets one of the kings whose stuff he, he recaptured for the king. And this king's name is the king of Sodom, one of the western suburbs. He lost all the stuff, and so he meets this king. Look at verse 17. Look what happens. After Abram returned from defeating uh, Kedalomar and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shaveh. That is the king's valley. Now, this is interesting. Look at the first thing out of this king of Sodom's mouth. First thing out of his mouth. Verse 21. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. Isn't that just something? I mean, Abram just did an amazing act of justice to bring peace. He just rescued all these people. And the first word out of this, king, this king's mouth is give me. Give me. You know what, you know what, no, no gratitude, nothing like that. He just says, give me. You know what, this king looks at Abram and says, you know what, you can keep all this stuff, but give me the people. And what does Abram do? Well, before we look at it, he does, well, look at verse 22. Look at verse 22. It says, but Abram said to the king of Sodom, notice this, with raised hand, notice this, a raised hand, I've sworn an oath to the Lord. With a raised hand, would you write this down, number two in your outline? Number two, put into practice what you've trained your hands to do. 
put into practice what you've trained your hands to do. Abram raised his hand and said, I swore an oath to the Lord. There's something that happened between Abram and God that had to do with Abram's hands. Look what he says again. Look at verse 22. With raised hand, I've sworn an oath to the Lord, God most high, creator of heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the strap of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. Here's what's happened there. Abram learned his lesson in Egypt. Remember when Abram ran away from the famine to control all of his blessings? He stopped worshiping at the altar. He stopped using his hand at the tent. He stopped doing all that. Abram, went, he, Abram learned his lesson in Egypt because in Egypt he had the best the world had to offer him. And the best the world has to offer us is not a blessing from God. Let, let me say that again. The best the world has to offer us is not a blessing from God. Abram refuses to be made rich at the hands of the king of Sodom and he gives back what he received. That took training. It takes training to give back what you receive. And by the way, by the way, guess who's listening to this conversation? The people that marched with Abram, Abram's allies, who don't even love God. But they know about Abram's conscience. They know about his convictions. And they're listening to Abram have this conversation with the king of Sodom, offering him all this, all this wealth and everything. And Abram's friends, and this is interesting, Abram doesn't say to his friends, and you're not going to have it either. He doesn't say that to them. Abram isn't interested in controlling the agenda of those who are his allies in this just cause. Abram's not going to tell them what to do. But he's not going to compromise his testimony. Because he learned some lessons in Egypt he's never going to forget. Now there's another king that Abram meets here. A king that Abram recovered all of his stuff. And he meets him after the battle. Look at verse 18. Verse 18 says, this is another king in the suburbs, the western suburbs. It says, then Melchizedek, king of Salem. By the way, did you know the word Melchizedek? It might say this in the bottom of your Bible somewhere. It means king of righteousness. Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Look at this, Melchizedek, the king of righteousness of Salem. Now, what's Salem? Salem is the ancient name for the city that later becomes Jerusalem. Jerusalem. He's the king of righteousness in the city of Jerusalem. Look what happens next. The king, of Mel king Melchizedek of Salem, look at this, brought out, isn't this amazing, bread and wine. What does that make you think of? It says, he was a priest of God Most High. Look at that. He came out with a gift of refreshment for Abram. And it looks like he wants to have communion with Abram. Imagine that. A king who rules Jerusalem and a priest who worships God. I think it sounds like somebody you and I know as followers of Jesus. Melchizedek is an Old Testament prophet, priest, and king. And he's foreshadowing Jesus, who is the ultimate prophet, priest, and king. Look what he says in verse 19. Look at what the king of Salem says in 1419. He says, blessed be Abram by God most high. He says, bless you, Abram. He doesn't sound like the king of Sodom that says, give me, give me, give me. This is a king who blesses by giving. Giving to us. He's a king who worships the same God that Abram's been worshiping. Look what he says next, verse 19. Creator of heaven and earth. Look at verse 20. And praise be to God most high who delivered your enemies into your hand. In other words, this king, this king of righteousness in the city of Jerusalem who brings out bread and wine looks at Abram and says, I know why you won. Yep, you got off your hands. Yep, you ignored all the prosperity and comfort you were, you were feeling as a 75-year-old man. You did the right thing. You rallied people together for that cause. You did all that. But Abram, you won because I know God, his hand of blessing is on you. And now look what Abram does. Verse 20, it says, Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. 
Abram knew he was in the presence of someone greater than Abram. And so he honors this prophet, priest, and king with a tithe, 10%. You know what's really interesting if you think about this? Whenever you and I go through a victory in life, we've come through something difficult, we've used our hands, we've confronted the enemy, we've done it nonviolently, in our case as followers of Jesus, we do all that. Sometimes we're tempted to think, you know what, I deserve some of the credit for what I've done. That's not what Abram does. What Abram does is he surrenders. He surrenders to the king, the priest of Jerusalem who had communion with him. And that took training. That's training that Abraham had received when he raised his hands as an oath to his God where he had built an altar and he lived in a tent. He was training his hands for that moment. Now, here's what I want to do. I want to teach you how you can put into practice what you've trained your hands to do as a follower of Jesus. I want to do this in a very practical way. It's a, it's a prayer practice that you can train your hands to do. It's going to give you a spiritual alignment, like a chiropractic alignment, uh, where, where you're going to be aligned in the way of Jesus so that you can practice living like Jesus when there's injustice. And it's a process. By the way, it's a process. It's always a process. It's a process of going from this condition to that condition. It's a process of thinking what I did before COVID hit and what I think now after COVID hit. It's a process of what I felt and what I was thinking before the death of George Floyd and after the death of George Floyd. It's a process of where are you and where is your brother? It's a process. You go from this to this. And it's something you can do with your body. You're going to use your arms. So here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to use your hands. You can do it even right there where you're seated or if you have hands free. I just want you to make a fist, make fists, and hold them up like this. Hold your fists like this. You're looking at your wrists, okay? And by the way, this is our natural human condition. We're always ready to fight with God and other people. We have... We have fists up. And what we're doing when we do this is we're fighting for our rights. That we're in control. That we can make something happen. And as a follower of Jesus, this, this is not what a follower of Jesus looks like. As followers of Jesus, we don't go around like this. And so we've got to go from this to this. And this is a sign of surrender. It's open hands. We have to go from this. So would you write this down? In your outline, would you write down from fists up to hands up in surrender to God? We're going to go from, from this and we're going to confess, we're going to let go, and we're going to surrender with raised hands to God. In other words, we're going to give things up. You can't pick up your cross and follow Jesus with a closed fist. You need an open hand. And you and I need to give our lives over to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We need to be saying, Jesus, you are in charge of me. Jesus, you are my prophet, priest, and king. So that's the first thing to train your hands to do. Go from this to this. Now here's the next thing I want you to do. With your hands again, I want you to, I want you to hold your fist out in front of you kind of like this. Not up here, but down here. Hold them like this. Your wrists are facing up. And by the way, this is a natural human posture also. This is a nat we have clenched hands. Why? Because we're going to grab stuff, we're going to take hold of it, and stuff is really important to us. And this is what we do. But as a follower of Jesus, we open up our hands, and, and, and we open up our life, and it's a posture of generosity. It's a posture like this. We go from this to this. Would you write this down? In your outline, would you write down, from hands clenched to hands open in generosity. Hands open in generosity. It reminds us of what Jesus said with our hands open. He said, freely you've received, freely give. Once Jesus gives you something, you don't do this and close your hand. You keep your hand open so that you can bless others. So everything that I've received, I'm choosing to give. And I just want you to even take a moment and just think about what, what is it today that you would choose to give to Jesus that he's put in your hands? 
So we're going to go from fist up to surrender. And we're going to go from hands clenched to hands open in generosity. Here's the third. The third movement is I want you to fold your arms like this. I want you to fold your arms like this. All too often, this is the way I live, like this, just like this. This is the, this is the natural human posture. I'm going to spectate. I'm going to criticize. I'm going to withdraw. What does this say when you meet someone like this who walks around like this all the time? They're choosing something. You know what? I don't want to get uncomfortable with that conversation or that question. I'm going to keep my hands folded. I'm just going to stay quiet over here. You see, a follower of Jesus doesn't keep their hands like this. Their arms don't stay in this position. As a follower of Jesus, we're on a mission. We're on a mission to love our neighbor as ourself. And so we're going to go from folded arms, we're going to go to open arms in mission to others. Would you write this down in your outline? Would you write down from folded arms to open arms in mission to others? This is where you say, you, say, you know what, God, I'm not going to make this day about me. I'm going to make this day about the people you bring across my path. You say to the Lord, you say to the Lord, God, here I am, send me. Send me. Make me a conduit. And you go to your neighbor and you say, I'm here, how can I help? That's what you say to your neighbor. Now, by the way, this is what our heart needs. Our hearts have to be trained along with our hands about how to respond in a time of violence. And this is what our world needs from us as followers of Jesus. They don't need our silence. And so I'm going to invite you to send a message to God at your personal altar today with your hands. Hands surrendered, hands in generosity, and hands extended in mission. Let's pray. Lord, you know that we live in a world that is controlled so often by violence. And so we, we offer you control of our lives and we surrender to you ourselves. And Lord, in a violent world, people need to see generosity. All men will know that you're my disciples by the love you have for one another. And in a hateful world, we need to have loving hands, Lord, that are on mission to our neighbor with our arms extended wide open. So make us this kind of people. You have told us what is good and what you require of us, and that is to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you. We pray this, Jesus, in your name.